Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Those of you who are no strangers to the Museum of Science know him as the man who voices the New England time capsule film. Those of you who are into fine art know him as a photographer. And Trekkies, you know him as Spock. That is right. Actor, actor Leonard Nimoy joins us in Studio 3. He's in town by way of the Boston Pops, hosting Out of This World, a spaced-themed production, which is on stage tonight and tomorrow at Symphony Hall. He also made a documentary with his son, filmmaker Adam Nimoy. It's titled Leonard Nimoy's Boston. It premiered last night on Channel 2 for future screenings, and there are going to be plenty. If you missed it last night, go to WGBH.org. Leonard Nimoy, so great to see you. Thank you so much for coming Thank in. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. It's great Thank to have you. you here. I just watched this documentary, which is so fantastic. You you and your son walk all around Boston, the Boston you grew up in, until the age of 18 when you left for Hollywood. Out of South Station. That's out of, right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, so we have a clip of the, the documentary right here, and it's when <laughs> you're in your, what, 16 or 17, when you're working for a rather disreputable vacuum company right on Boylston <laughs> Street in, in 1948. Here's a listen. They ran what they call a bait and switch operation. They would advertise a used Electrolux vacuum cleaner, which was a famous name, for nine or ten dollars. And the job was to sell upward. You got one for a sample to show, don't sell it. The machine you want to sell cost about a hundred bucks. So it took a certain amount of confidence and salesmanship. It was useful later in going on some of the acting auditions that I went on. This was such a sweet documentary, you walking around with your son, <laughs> until we realized that you were you know, you're a shifty salesman. <laughs> Very shifty. I was dangerous. <laughs> Very shifty. But prior to that, I have to tell you, I was so moved because you grew up in the West End, and for people who don't know what the West End is, it's it's like the Lower East Side of, of New York. It's where That's the right. immigrants went, and, yeah. and you were all crowded, as I know you were, in apartment buildings, and, then, and it was right adjacent to Mass General Hospital and the Charles River Prime location, and because of that reason, it was leveled, taken by eminent domain. So I'm wondering, what is it like, that the fact that you, you essentially can't go home now, that you have all these wonderful memories of where you grew up, but it doesn't exist anymore? It's very sad. Uh, many years ago, uh, maybe 25 years ago, I took my, uh, came to Boston with my wife, and I wanted to show her where I had grown up, and we could not find the street. Uh, we walked into the, into the area that was the West End, but the streets are so totally reconfigured that there's no connection to what it used to be. The only connection we found that my son Adam and I found when we were making the documentary was the uh, uh, the St. Joseph's Church. And we actually sat on the steps, he and I, of the St. Joseph's Church, and I pointed to the left where I could show him, where I could actually, uh, where we could see St. Joseph's from the window of our apartment building. It was only half a block away. But now it was so totally different that it was unrecognizable. So in a sense, I feel uprooted, but at the same time, uh, I, I still have a great connection with the city. I love being in Boston. I always look forward to coming back. You know, Leonard Nimoy, I wonder how your parents reacted to uh, taking of their their neighborhood. Your father was a barber in Mattapan. Your mother was yeah. a homemaker. How did they react? Well, they were they were very uh, stubborn about leaving. They were <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> they were among the last people to leave. They stayed and stayed and stayed. I left in 1949. And they were there until the very end. I think that building was one of the last to come down. They left, I think, in 1959. And, and by that time, the West End was just gone. And they, they would have stayed forever until they passed away. But they were just forced to move. They had to get out. Or well, the building would have been torn down around them, so they moved out to Dorchester. And and did they uh, did they keep in touch at all with the, with the old neighbors from the West End? Oh, yeah. End? Oh, yeah. The West End was a very close-knit neighborhood. It was really a village, in a way. Uh, there was a, a Harvard sociologist uh, named uh, Gans who wrote a book called The Urban Villagers about the West End. It was a unique neighborhood, absolutely unique. So where did the young teen Leonard Nimoy hang out when he was a, 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 <laughs> a young ruffian around Boston? I split my time between the Elizabeth Peabody House, which was on Charles Street, and the West End House, which was on Blossom Street. The Peabody House was, was a wonderful place that had a, a sports program, a, sci a science program. They had a science lab where my brother began his interest in science, and he became a chemical engineer with, with a, a graduate degree from MIT. And they also had a wonderful theater, a 375-seat theater, beautiful theater. And that's where I first started acting when I was eight years old. I walked out on stage as Hansel did a production of Hansel and Gretel. <laughs> and, <laughs> and somehow I just kept on doing it. And by the time I was about 17... There was a play being done there called Awake and Sing, and I was cast in that as the juvenile. It was my first time 
in a drama, in an adult drama, which is a family about a family very much like my own family. Three generations living in one apartment, just like we did, my grandparents and my parents and my brother and I. And I was so taken with it. I was so moved by being involved in a play that really spoke to our generation about our people that I decided this was the way I wanted to make my, my life, uh, my living, and, and this is the way I wanted to live my life. And I, that's when I decided to move to California and study acting seriously. Well, it's so hard to believe that with this voice that you have, and of course we know it so well, as we mentioned at the Museum of Science, that you had a very thick Boston accent. I did, I did. <laughs> I, I went to school at the Pasadena Playhouse School of the Theater. I was only there for about six months. I was disappointed in the school in general, but I had a great speech teacher. And when I left Boston, I, if you had asked me what part I, I played in, in, in the TV show, I would say I was Spock from Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> so it still comes right back to you. You can well, never I, escape uh, it. Well, after, after, after about six months of hard work, it was really hard work. The change of speech is not easy. And uh, because there's more to it than just the sound. It's a, it's a whole psychological thing about the way you sound. And I really didn't want to let it go. I thought, I, this is who I am, you know. But then I thought, I'd better change my speech because it'll make, me, it'll make it possible for me to get more different kinds of work. We're talking with Leonard Nimoy, who is in town by way of the Boston Pops, and also because this documentary that he made with his son premiered last night on uh, WGBH Channel 2. You know, everyone knows you as, as Spock from Star Trek, but when I look at your resume, you were in almost every single solitary great television show from the late 50s and early 60s, Sea Hunt, The yeah. Twilight Zone, yeah. Highway Patrol with <laughs> right. Broderick Brock Crawford, Crawford right. yeah, Perry Mason, Rawhide, that was with Clint Eastwood. With Clint it? Eastwood, that's yeah, right. Yeah, The Untouchables, that was another great series. You got any good stories from any of those? Uh, <laughs> got any tales from the young Clint Eastwood oh, God, or you know, uh, Perry Mason th- th- or anything? Those were struggling days. I, I was happy to get each and every one of those jobs. I lived in a neighborhood a few blocks away from Lloyd Bridges, who was the star of this uh, Sea Hunt television series. I remember series. it. And when things got really desperate, I would get in my car and drive by his house very slowly <laughs> to see if maybe he was outside watering the lawn. And one time it actually worked. I was driving by. I had worked the show a couple of times. I needed a job, and I was driving by, and there he was outside. And I yelled, hey, Lloyd, how are you? Leonard Nemo, I remember. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm looking for a job. He said, just a minute. He went inside the house, made a phone call, came back out, and he said, you start in two days. I had a three-day job, which paid a couple hundred dollars and paid the rent that month. You know? Wow, wow. Yeah, he was a great guy. You were also on Bonanza. Uh, yes, a couple times. Yeah. Yes, yes, that's right. And Gunsmoke a couple times. And, um, oh, I was, all, I was on all those shows. I did them all. I did Rawhide. I did um, Wagon Train. I did... Uh, um, I played the man from cops Uncle, and robbers, the man from and Uncle. I played good guys, bad guys. I played Indians, and every once in a while, I even did some science fiction. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, you landed in this show that a lot of people have heard about. So I have a confession to make to you. A few years ago, I was in Greece. I was standing at the placa at the base of the Acropolis, and I heard this very distinctive voice behind Were me. Were you there? I was there, and I turned around, because I think, that sounds like Leonard Nimoy. I spun <laughs> around, and I saw this tall, distinguished gentleman, and what did I do? to figure out if it was really you, I looked at your ears. <laughs> what a, I was such a war. But I, I feel somewhat validated because I've come to understand that you brought a lot of yourself to Spock. I did. I did. I was very fortunate to find a role that, that welcomed me, and I welcomed it. I took it to heart. I was very serious about that character because I did. I, I identified with him a lot. Uh, Spock was, uh, was a character who was sort of outside the mainstream. He was the other, the alien and I grew up feeling that way. I I felt that I was I was one of the one of the minority, and Spock was not at home on Vulcan because he was half human. He was not on, at home on Earth because he was half Vulcan. The kids on Vulcan teased him because he was a half breed, and that's why he went into into the uh, the, the space work. Uh, he I, I was I was struck by what the what the character had in the way of uh, intelligence, and usefulness, and professionalism, and dignity. Above all, dignity. It meant a lot to me. Yeah. Why did Why did the Leonard Nimoy, the real Leonard Nimoy, Leonard Nimoy, feel like you were an outsider? Why? Well, um, I grew up in this very mixed neighborhood. Uh, the people on the floor below us were Italian. The people on the floor below that were Irish. Uh, we had very good friends in, in all of the denominations. But uh, being Jewish, I was definitely in a minority. You were in a minority. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I felt like I was I was not mainstream. You know. 
And, but that must be, you, there must have been some comfort out in Los Angeles and Hollywood because that's where a lot of people went when, when, they, when they're considered other because they have these ar- right. other artistic sensibilities. They have that's these right. other selves. So what, did well, you that's find... Well, true. I found a different kind of world in California where it was a, a, there was not that, that kind of strong uh, cultural identity. It was a, a, an easier mix of people. Not that I enjoyed it more, but I felt I had a different feeling. I felt like, oh, okay, this is what California is all about. This is what Hollywood is all about. But the most important thing for me was to be involved in the arts. I wanted to be to make a living in the arts, and and that's why I went to California because I thought out there I had a chance to do it, and uh, and it worked out. It worked out for me. Fortunately, it, it took a while. It took a while to build a career, but it worked out. Leonard Nimoy, I read somewhere where you saved your last pair of ears. I have them, yeah. Where, where, where you got them? They the bathroom? They're in a, and... No, they're in a small box with a glass front uh, sitting on my desk to remind me of where I came from. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, and I also read, I thought this was fascinating, and maybe it relates to what you just said about feeling a little bit like an outsider, that when you uh, worked as, as on Star Trek, you'd be very long days during the week, get through on Friday, and then you somehow maintained your role as Spock on Saturday and well into Sunday yeah. afternoon. What was that about? Yeah, well, uh, I guess you'd call it method acting. I was deep inside this character for many hours each week, 12 hours a day for five days a week, 60 hours a week. I was, I was in the Spock character. I'd come home, take off the makeup, um, grab something fast to eat, study my lines for tomorrow, and still in Spock character and go to sleep. Wake up in the morning and bang, right into the makeup chair and back into Spock. So... The weekend was the only time that I had to slip out of the character, and it took a while. I could still feel Spock around all day Saturday, and he'd start to leave about midday on Sunday. (laughs) And then I'd I'd start to slip back into Leonard Nimoy. By Sunday night, I was free of Spock, but Monday morning, right back into character. For three years, that's the way it was. So at the same time that you started your acting career in Hansel and Gretel, you also started <laughs> a photography career. You were develop- yeah. you're literally developing in your, your one bathroom that you're sharing with all of your family members. Yes. So you've had a lifelong passion for photography. Yes, exactly. I mean, yes. It, it, what, what's your entry point there? I mean, what really uh, draws well, you about the skill? A neighborhood friend in the West End showed me how to develop a roll of film and make a print in your own darkroom. You could go to the Kodak store, which was on Bromfield Street, and for 15 cents you could buy a package of chemicals, and that was all you needed, and maybe a a packet of paper for another 15 to 25 cents. So with that kind of an investment, I could take the family camera and go out and shoot some pictures and come home and start developing and making prints immediately in the bathroom, which was exciting to me, very exciting. Uh, I stayed with my interest in photography forever, but got serious about it. When I finished Star Trek and did two seasons on Mission Impossible and left that show because I, I really had had enough of it, I went back to school to UCLA to study photography seriously because I really considered changing careers. What I realized was that I did not want to do commercial photography, shooting cars and clothes and, and fashion and that kind of I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do what's known as fine art photography. Very difficult to make a living at it, so I decided to stick with my acting career. <laughs> but, I, but I've always loved photography, and I have continued to do it ever since. We're speaking with Leonard Nimoy, who's done some very fascinating things with your career as, as a fine arts photographer. One of them was from a few years back, but I found this totally fascinating, was the Big Body Project. Yeah. We photographed a lot of women that are not just a little bit heavy, that are really, really heavy. Large body women. Yeah. Yes, and, and they look, a lot of them, Really beautiful, and you never see pictures yeah. like that. Why did you do that? Well, it started with uh, a woman who came to me after I was showing some of my earlier work from a project called Shekhina in Northern California, where I, I had a home, and, and a, a woman came to me afterward, and she said, I'm a model, I'm a different body type than you've been working with. Will you be interested in shooting me? And she was a very large lady. And I was concerned. I thought, I'm not quite sure I know what to do with this because I had, I had been shooting classic type figures she came to our studio, and my wife and I photographed her. And, and uh, when I showed her pictures, she was uh, she, quite large, quite large. When I showed her pictures w- along with other work, she was the one who got all the attention. People were fascinated because you never see that. Exactly. Uh, th- that kind of nude figure, almost like sculpture. And uh, I, I, I thought there's something going on here in our culture that I think uh, people are interested in and, and might want to learn about. So I found this group of women, large body women in San Francisco, and I photographed them, and that became the, the, the full body project. What kind of reaction did you get? Because we never see or rarely see uh, I got full a, body. Lot, a lot of interest, a lot of interest, a lot of people asking the same question, who are these people and why are you shooting them? 
And I was shooting them because there is this, this cultural question in our, in our society about what people should look like. And women in our culture are told what they should look like by the cosmetic companies, the, the clothing companies, the diet companies. People want to sell you something. That's right. Take, uh, take these pills, buy these clothes, uh, uh, take this exercise program, buy it from us, and, and you will look like, like you're supposed to look. You know? Well, what are you supposed to You're supposed to look like who you are. And, and people have been taught to chase this dream by paying f something to somebody to, to try to achieve that kind of a look. So I, that, that's what it was all about. I thought it was very interesting to raise the conversation about this subject. Did it change the way you, you made photography after? Because you, you just mentioned how you were sort of anxious about doing it and you didn't quite know how to do it. So it, it must have tested you. So did, did it... You know, many years ago, I, was, I had a good friend named Marsha Tucker who was the founder of the, uh, she was the uh, founder of the New Museum of Contemporary Art in New York. For a while, she was the chief curator at the Whitney Museum. She was a good friend and a great supporter of the arts. And she said to me, do what scares you as an artist. Do what scares you. Do the thing that you would normally shy away from. And explore it. And let's find out what, what's there that, that, in, that scares you and bothers you. Maybe you'll find something interesting. And that's what I was thinking when I took on the Full Body Project. I thought, this scares me. I'm going to do it. Oh, go ahead, Joe. I, I was going to ask if you shoot, shoot on film or digital. I shot almost exclusively on film, which I processed myself until my last project, which was called Secret Selves, which I shot in Northampton. Uh, at oh, my, tell people my, about that. That's yeah. a fascinating one, too. Yeah. Well, I came across this, uh, this story from the ancient Greeks. Uh, uh, supposedly, there was a symposium discussing human angst. What is this thing that we all feel uneasy about? And uh, Aristophanes, a poet, a philosopher of the period, said that he had an a, a explanation for human angst. He said, humans at one time were double people attached back to back. We had four arms, four legs, and two heads. Really? And, yeah, and he said that the humans became very powerful and arrogant. And I don't know how you'd be powerful. And I think you'd, you'd be encumbered, you know. But he said, anyway, that's what he said. And he, and he said the gods became angry, and they sent Zeus to solve the problem. So Zeus took a big sword, split everybody in two, and sent them on their separate paths, and we became two hands, two feet, and one head. However, he said, ever since then, humans have felt some part of themselves is missing. Something is missing in their lives. And that's, that's the explanation of human angst, people trying to get in touch with their other part of themselves to reintegrate, to become whole again. I thought, what a fascinating story. So we set up a series of interviews and, and uh, portrait sessions in Northampton where I photographed 100 people. They were invited to, to come and have me photograph them as their secret or hidden or fantasy self. And boy, some wonderful people came in with that. <laughs> and you had a big exhibit at BU as well of that, which was widely, re widely yeah. well received. Leonard yeah. Nimoy, it has been fascinating and wonderful and a great treat to speak with you. And thank you. And thank you so much for being with us. We really appreciate Tonight, it. Tonight, Symphony Hall. Tonight, Symphony yes. Hall. We're going to give all the info in just you, a second. Yeah, you can catch Leonard Nimoy, N Nimoy excuse me, tonight and Saturday at the Boston Pops, where he's hosting Out of This World, a space-themed production led by guest conductor Sarah Hicks. To learn more about tickets and showtimes, go to bso.org slash Boston Pops. And if you want to see Leonard Nimoy's Boston, which he made with his son, filmmaker Adam Nimoy, go to WGBH.org for Showtime's Leonard Nimoy. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Up Great next, pleasure. It's Open Mic with Emily Rooney and her famous list of obsessions and observations. This is 89.7 WGBH Boston Public Radio. <laughs>